Okay, so I just want to make a disclaimer before this video starts. I am currently in the middle of a move as I, well, I have been for the past week. Bottom line, so everything's a gong show right now. You can't really see it, but yeah, that's kind of why uploads have been very sporadic. And yeah, anyways, let's get started. After talking a lot about Arkham Asylum and Hidden Roadblock on the Arkham City video, I finally asked myself, why was I putting all of this effort into a game that isn't even based on my favorite superhero? In this case, Spider-Man. <laughs> Now, I played all the Spider-Man games from the 6th generation onward, and whenever a discussion around great Spider-Man games came up, most of the time, the same titles were thrown around. Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man PS4, Ultimate Carnage, and a couple more, but I don't often hear about Ultimate Spider-Man. This game was released way back in 2005 and was riding off the success of Spider-Man 2, which was essentially Spider-Man's Ocarina of Time, and Ultimate Spider-Man was Spider-Man's Wind Waker, even down to the transition from realistic graphics to a more cartoonish style. Now this was one of the first video games, let alone Spider-Man games I ever played, so do keep that in mind, I will be a little bit biased. So, if you have some time, I'd like to talk to you about the pros and cons of this brutally underrated game, and whether or not it's worth your... $173? The fuck? Firstly, with presentation, you'll notice this game looks great, even up to today's standards. The cell shaded art style makes the game look smooth as butter, along with having a neat comic book charm to it. Sure, there are some pop-ins here or there, and I guess there are some bugs, but overall, it looks pretty good. Every level begins with some artwork that's taken from the comic the level is based off of, and these pieces of art look so good. Frame rate never dipped, even during the more chaotic set pieces. That leads me into the topic of the biggest set piece in the game, New York. The place looks alright. The buildings are usually all blocky in Queens, but the Big Apple itself has some decent enough building designs that while not entirely accurate, are believable and fun to rip around on. There are people in the streets and cars driving around, though the game doesn't really feel as alive as something like Spider-Man 2. Invisible walls do break immersion, but I understand that with the hardware at the time, they may not have been able to handle such a large world. Character designs are surprisingly accurate to the comic, with main characters like Peter, Spider-Man, MJ, and others looking like they're ripped straight out of a comic book. Which, of course, is kind of what they were going for. You can tell this is what they wanted, as the cutscenes are shown through frames of a comic book, and even at the beginning of each mission, you see a cover for said mission. And at this point, I should mention, big thanks to Nam for pointing out that the entire story and even some of the character designs are entirely original. Back to the characters, the villains shown all look fantastic and the designs are memorable, especially for characters like Rhino, Venom, Green Goblin, and Beetle, and even a few alternate costumes that are unlockable for Spider-Man. While we're on the topic of character designs though, there is a point of contention between myself and a lot of my friends. The symbiote within the game, despite being called the Black Suit, is purple. This is because the black suit in the comic was often highlighted and shaded with blue or purple, and some would say that, at least within the game, the symbiote would look better if it was just straight black, with minor purple highlights instead of the other way around. I personally feel it looks good though, like it gives off this toxic feel to it and I love it, and it fits with the artistic style of the game. So, in order to spark a discussion about this, I have longtime friend Nam12399 here to argue such. So with that, I will hand it off to you, Nam. Thanks for having me, Nolan. I would never pass up the opportunity to prove how much of a fucking idiot you are. Let's get this straight. I love Mark Bagley's artwork. It not only defined the style of the Ultimate Spider-Man video game, but also the comic it was based on. But there's always been one choice that bothered the hell out of me, even back when I played this game when I was just a kid. Why is the black suit purple? Look, hear me out for a second. I know it's purple because it's supposed to be light reflecting off the costume to give it more depth, but that doesn't really translate too well in the video game. Well, that's because he You see, the way to shade black in a drawing is to give it a highlight. Back in the 90s, Venom was given blue highlights to help define his muscles and to give the drawing much more depth. Well, I was thinking the reason it's purple is because- When this is translated into a game with lighting engines, that's when things get a bit screwy. In an attempt to capture the art style of the comic book, the developers wanted to give the black suit, as well as Venom, the same purple tint that was seen in the few issues he was in. But what bothers me is the way the developers achieved this effect. I have no background knowledge in 3D character creation or lighting engines, so take what I say with a grain of salt. This is just speculation on my end. The way lighting works in this game is like this. Rather than casting a realistic shadow on the characters, there are portions of the model that will be lit differently when the light is obscured. For example, there are portions on Spider-Man's classic costume that will appear as pitch black when there's no lighting on it. This is to achieve the harsh shadows that the comic book had to provide character depth. This explains why the blue portions of Spider-Man's costume is actually purple in this game. The color purple might have been picked up differently in the lighting engine than any other colors to achieve the shading effect. Either that or portions of the suit are coded to react to light differently than other parts. Now I know you may be wondering, okay, what's the problem with that? Well, for the most part, Venom in the black suit are shown during the nighttime when there isn't a lot of natural light. In the first cutscene, we see Spider-Man swing around the city at night with the black suit. During this portion, because of the limited lighting, 
The suit looks pretty similar to the way it looks in the comic on certain stills, but in motion, the light begins to move all across the body, constantly changing the way the suit looks. The suit looks almost glossy and like it's made out of plastic. It's even worse if you use the costume during the daytime, where the purple just overpowers the look of the suit. That could be intentional for all I know, but in my opinion doesn't look too good. I appreciate the fact that the devs even bothered to attempt to keep the look close to the source, but this is a case where I think just changing the colors up a bit would have suited the art style of the game a lot more. Some may say I sound like an idiot for complaining about the color of a costume. Well, I'd like to argue that they shouldn't call it the black suit in the costume menu when it's clearly purple. Is this a nitpick? Yes, but I'm going to defend my stance until the bitter, bitter end. So with that being said, let's talk about some animations. The animations only add to how immersive the world is. Spider-Man swings with violent speed once you get the hang of it, and the flips and spins done in the air only add to the acrobatic design of the arachnid hero. The kicks and flips he does while fighting are just as good as expected, and there's enough variety in these animations for them to not get old, and to feel as fresh as possible. The animations in the cutscenes are fluid and fun, it's easy to tell that a lot of love was put into this game. The voice acting in the game is good too, at least, except for Peter. Now don't get me wrong, Peter sounds good and all, but some of his super whiny line delivery can make some cutscenes be a little more funny than dramatic. Don't make me hurt you, Eddie, I'm totally serious. You need to call- I need to quit getting almost killed by stupid people is what I need. Every other character like Eddie and Silver Sable sound awesome, and they're the go-to voices I think of when I hear their names. There is enough tranquilizer in your system to take down a really large horse. Don't fight it. I don't even know how I'm still alive. If you could call this alive. While we're on the topic of sounds, let's talk about some of the sound effects within the game. The sound of the webs being shot out feels satisfying, and the multiple attacks you use have a nice punch, no pun intended. Every aspect comes together to make things like cutscenes super fun and enjoyable. They have this comic book feel to them, with the characters often jumping from one frame to the other. Don't worry, ah, nothing's broken, except my spine, a few ribs, maybe everything else. Ow. Unfortunately, the downsides of the cutscenes is that they're very inconsistent, ranging from really fun and cool to just downright hilarious. Now, when I played this as a kid, I do not remember it looking like this, but when I played this on PC, the cutscenes were just golden. I took this opportunity to watch some cutscenes on a stream, so here's some highlights from that. So, oh, this is the best, it's the best cutscene. Look for the T posing venom. Can you find him? There it is. <laughs> There's something just so poetic about like a T posing man and just consuming someone. Like it's kind of scary in a way. Look at Venom, he's in the back tree posing! <laughs> Edward! <laughs> His fucking face, dude. Edward, wake up. And, even, and even Eddie wakes up, he's like, What is going on? Where, where am I? <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. Overall, considering the technology and the standards of the time, this game looks pretty decent. It's obviously not a timeless masterpiece, but it's good enough and some of the cutscenes can serve as some real eye candy. I'd love to see how this game would look if there were a remastered, like something akin to Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Now, presentation in my eyes is one of the most important parts to a game, but it doesn't really mean anything if the gameplay itself isn't very fun. Speaking of which, gameplay feels good. Case in point, webs stick to buildings. The swinging works well with its boost mechanic, which allows you to get a little extra kick out of a swing, and combining that with a jump, you can end up gaining speed pretty fast and gaining altitude is even better. There is an issue with a lot of Spider-Man games, especially the older ones, and that is gaining altitude through swinging. Well, this game has a solution, and this solution is web climbing. When you're pressing and holding X, you can start climbing your web, and this can be done whenever on a line even when in motion. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't revolutionize swinging, but it's a nice feature as it allows you to move just as quickly on the Y axis as you would on any other axis, allowing for an incredible amount of freedom. When it comes to the controls, everything feels tight and it's easy to use and hard to master, and trust me, there is quite a lot to master. As the game goes on, you unlock more races to complete, and these races are pretty fun, all things considered, and you'll need a fair amount of skill to get the platinum medal on each of them. Though as you complete races, you'll eventually get a call from Johnny Storm from the Fantastic Four. He serves as an actual race partner, and these 
these races are really where your skills are put to use. The first two or even three races may not be too hard taking place in Queens, but eventually these races span the entire city and become so difficult that I would argue complete mastery over the swinging is required. I swear, I spent hours on this final race, and while this is a pretty minuscule point, I like that there isn't any rubber banding. To give a brief description of what rubber banding essentially is, it's an artificial way of making races more intense by speeding up or slowing down your AI opponent. For example, if your opponent is ahead, then they will slow down and become clumsier, though if they're behind, their car, for example, will reach speeds that are near impossible. This can, in some cases, make winning feel great because you sped through with only milliseconds to spare. However, the negative edge of this sword is that you'll likely lose by a hair, more often than not making the loss more frustrating and discouraging. Now, these Johnny Storm races could have easily used rubber banding to make it more intense, but they didn't. And God, am I happy about that. It's satisfying as an experienced player to just slam through the early races, leaving Johnny Storm in the dust. However, because Storm follows the same path and the same speed every time without any variety, you're not really racing him instead of just doing a time trial against a character on screen. Bottom line, with that slight rant out of the way, the races are fun and near the end super challenging. These races and time trials aren't the only thing you can do outside the main story. There's also city events that can be completed, and doing them along with races, combat tours, and collecting the collectible tokens will be required to progress. It doesn't usually take much to open the next mission, and it's usually just collecting a token or doing a race and so on. The only thing you will have to consistently do is the city events. These are really neat as they involve bank robberies, car chases, returning mini bosses, taking an injured person to a hospital, and a bunch more. There are also combat tours, which leads me into the combat of the game. And actually, before we get into the combat of the game, I should explain that combat tours are basically where you just go from one place to another, beating up enemies until eventually you win. That's it. So anyways, combat is pretty fun in this game, with one button being dedicated to your fist, while another is dedicated to your feet. Simply put, one button punches and one button kicks. Hitting the button a few times will do a basic combo, so you have a punching combo and a kicking combo. However, more can be done if you chain them together, such as instead of doing a punch, 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 you can mix it up with a punch, kick, kick kick, punch, punch, and so on. As you complete story missions, you'll unlock bigger combos, such as instead of a three-punch combo, you can now have a four-punch combo, and even a five-punch combo. There are also different moves that involve airstrike attacks, similar to a Sonic-style homing attack. When an enemy is knocked down, the fight isn't quite over, though. You'll notice when an enemy is down that there's a web symbol over their heads. This is your indication that you should web them up, and this is a neat way to handle combat. And it makes sense canonically, because he doesn't want to kill people, so obviously he's pulling his punches. This makes combat a little more interesting, as you could try and down everyone at once, and then web them up as fast as possible, or take them down and web them one by one. Now, while I think combat is very fun and super cool, I have some issues with it. One issue is that there's no dodge or counter button. When an enemy is about to attack you, there's a little symbol indicating that something will be coming your way, whether that be a melee or ranged attack. However, what good does that do when your only option is to jump away, typically just straight out of the fight? This makes the flow of combat all out of whack. I mean, you end up jumping in, doing one or two hits, and then jumping out. This leads to nearly every fight being cheesed by jumping around like crazy while doing aerial attacks, and this is seen in most of the boss fights too. This game has a metric fuckload of bosses. And that's great! I mean, you get to see different characters ranging from the ones you love to the ones you may not have heard of. Nearly all of these boss fights are boiled down to jumping around, doing a kick here or there, and in some cases, just jumping around until the enemy doesn't attack them makes them vulnerable. Fortunately though, these boss fights still serve as some cool set pieces. Finally, there's one thing that this game does a fair bit that might be a deal breaker for some of you and that is quick time events. However, these are done sparingly and do not intrude on cutscenes. Some people see this as a deal breaker, but I promise you it's not that bad in this case. I just felt the need to bring that up because some people consider it a war crime in video games. Now that is essentially it for the gameplay, and with that, that's all I have to say. However, if you've not gone out and bought the game for <coughs> 570 bucks, fuck me, then allow me to present you my ace in the hole. Now playing as Spider-Man is gnarly, but what if I told you that you could also play as Venom. Yeah, exactly. This just turned to the coolest fucking game ever. Here's a little quiz for you. Name another Spider-Man game that lets you play as Venom with as much depth as Spider-Man. I'll wait. <laughs> Trick question, fucking none of them. Venom looks like a monster. He's big, bulky, he's kind of gross, and I love it. He moves like an animal, being able to leap buildings in a single bound, and he uses tendrils to launch himself forward, similar to a web zip. As far as movement, that's pretty much it. It's very similar to Spider-Man, as he can climb walls and jump high and so on, but however, his biggest strength is his combat abilities. He can not only attack using his claw-like hands or through his long-range tendrils, but he can also grab people by the fucking head, allowing him to do an awesome attack. 
Can you guess what it is? Is it A, slam him into the ground, B, throw him across a fucking country, or C, break his back? Another trick question, you can do all of them. I know, awesome. There's even more to the combat, which is your health bar. Well, all right, we know what a health bar is and how it works. When it hits zero, you die. So just don't get hit too much and that's it, right? Well, no. Essentially, because Venom is using a symbiotic alien, his health slowly drains as you play. Well, shit, how do you deal with that? Easy, eat people. Remember that annoying little shit in Spider-Man 2 couldn't hold onto a balloon to save his life? They literally let you eat him in this game. Even though the exact same kid shows up later, but whatever all right okay anyways this is how you gain health you literally drain the life force of the civilians and it increases your health now it's not ideal to consume enemies as they won't give you as much so your best bet is to find civilians however due to the missions taking place in the dead of night or in the midst of a bullet storm civilians aren't littered around making combat a little more complex make sure you tear the ass out of the enemies while also keeping your health in check venom even has his own boss fights meaning this game is packed with fun stuff to do Thank you for listening to my rant. I'm going to calm down now. Anyways, if you haven't been convinced to pick this up yet, or at least emulate it, then I will now talk about the story and the missions that go along with it, including boss fights. I didn't want to talk about this stuff earlier, as I wanted to not spoil the fun set pieces if you were convinced so far. So if you want to get this game, do it now and stop watching. Please, trust me. So, in order to give some context as to where the game begins, I'll actually just play the first cutscene, as it's pretty short and concise, so take a look. This is how it all began. Ah! Which, of course, ah! leads to nonsense like this. A few months ago, I reunited with my childhood friend, Eddie Brock. What is that? It's our inheritance. Eddie's dad and my dad worked together before they died. We believe the suit may be the final step. Finally, a cure for cancer. People are dying all over the world. And all I want to do is try to help them. But because I signed the wrong paper for the wrong person, I can't. They had taken the suit away from Dad, and I was going to take it back. I thought, I knew, I could finish what he started. I felt good. Great. More than myself. It didn't last. What's happening to me? Get this off of me! I don't know what the suit had become or what it had done to me, but I have super spider powers and I couldn't control it, so I don't think anyone could ever hope to. But when Eddie found out what I had done, who I really was, well, he was pretty angry. Our fathers died to create me, and now you will too. Okay, now that that's out of the way, we pick up at the Midtown High football field, in a fight with Venom that takes place across Queens. It ends with Venom getting slammed by some electrical wire, and we take off. We then cut to three months later, where we get our tutorial of sorts while we wait for our suit to get patched up by Mary Jane. After the tutorial, we pick up our newly patched up suit, and upon doing that, we go after a call about Herman Schultz, who you may know as the Shocker. I never knew your name was Herman. Oh no, it's you! We easily take him down by webbing up his devices, causing them to overload, and he fries himself. <laughs> Afterwards, we save a lady from peril, and upon doing that, we head home for the day. The next day, we begin by doing some city events, and upon doing so, engage in a combat tour and a race against Johnny Storm. After which, we begin our first mission playing as Venom. During this tutorial mission, we learn all of Venom's attacks and abilities and end off the level with a gnarly boss fight against Wolverine, which ends in beautiful fashion. After this, we switch back to Spider-Man. During his exams, he gets a call that a rhino-looking robot has been rampaging around Queens, and Spider-Man must go and take care of it. After cleaning up after its mess, we catch up to this robot rhino who sounds really nerdy, but whatever. We eventually bait this rhino into punching some wet cement, and when he gets stuck, 
We slam a wrecking ball into him and continue our chase into a car dealership. Cars are flying everywhere and the rhino is charging all over, and this boss fight is simple as all you have to do is wait for him to short out the crack in his suit and slam him in. Upon defeating him, you see the suit came from Trask Industries, and upon opening the rhino, you see it's just a nerdy little kid inside. After which, Spider-Man realizes he has a pounding headache, and we see that Eddie Brock is in close proximity to him on the streets below. Next up is a Venom mission, where he has to avoid Silver Sable's militia, and this mission isn't much, but like everything else in this game, it's still pretty fun for the combat alone. Next up is a school field trip at the museum, but unfortunately, both Eddie and Peter are there, and they both sense each other's presence, commencing in a battle on the rooftop which is one of the cooler battles, I should add. Unfortunately, the headache Spider-Man gets makes fighting pretty hard, but overall this fight is awesome, and eventually it leads to the streets, where Sable captures Venom and heads off. The next mission sees Eddie being captured, and he is sent to test his suit by chasing down Electro, which eventually leads them to Times Square. Upon getting there, Venom gets slammed out, and when Spider-Man intervenes, he gets knocked down pretty hard. When Venom sees this, he jumps back in, and we engage in one of the best boss fights in any Spider-Man game. We have to take down Electro by throwing cars at him and at the same time make sure he doesn't kill Spider-Man. Add this on top of the Times Square set piece and this is made all the better. Eventually Electro gets tired and absorbs the electricity from the neon signs and billboards causing him to power up really hard. So not only now are you looking after Spider-Man, but you're also trying to take down a powered up Electro who can heal himself using the billboards. So make sure you destroy those when you can. Eventually, when you make it through, S.H.I.E.L.D. jumps in and captures Electro while Venom gets away. Later that night, we see a strange Iron Man looking guy who I think is named Beetle tear some ass at the S.H.I.E.L.D. base and eventually gets into a room with the Green Goblin, where we cut to Nick Fury who says that somehow the Green Goblin has escaped. We then cut to Spider-Man hanging out when he sees the Beetle fly by, drawing his attention. After we chase him down, he enters a building and grabs a vial labeled Sandman. I'd like to take this time to tell you that this will never come up again, unfortunately. This whole Sandman thing goes nowhere and so don't get your hopes up, seriously. Anywho, we chase him down even more, and after a boss fight on a construction site, Beetle flies away. Meanwhile, the next day, Venom breaks out and engages in a full-on fight with Silver Sable that eventually turns into a chase spanning the entire city, ending in Venom taking down a helicarrier. That night, Spider-Man heads back to the construction site that Beetle was in so that he can investigate where Beetle might have gone. But upon entering a house, the Green Goblin jumps out and we give chase to him after cleaning up his mess, and eventually we start to battle him on the street. After Biddy grabs us and slams us from the air into another building, leading to the second half of the fight. It's the usual wait till he burns himself out and then literally attack until you win, but by the time Spider-Man knocks him out, S.H.I.E.L.D. arrives and cleans up the rest. Meanwhile, Venom has his own encounter with Beetle and engages in a chase until heading into a warehouse to put him down for good. The next day, Peter is doing his thing when he's kidnapped by Sable, but he breaks out and during their fight they end up turning the bridge that they're on into chaos. Teaming up for a short while, they save everyone in danger, but Venom steps in to kidnap Sable. We chase him down and engage in another boss fight that isn't much compared to anything else, and eventually the two end up knocking each other out. Finally, Eddie wakes up and begins hearing symbiote-like screams coming from the other room, and we see some sort of carnage-like suit that engages us in a really neat boss fight. This, of course, is Peter, who is injected with the symbiote and eventually Venom consumes the suit, leading him to become even more powerful, and he even gets a little neat white spider on his chest. When this happens, Eddie states that he's going to take down Trask, and when we go to warn him, Venom jumps in to intercept, and we engage in the final boss fight. This set piece is super cool as there's rain coming down while lightning adds extra dramatic effect, and this time Eddie's not messing around with him doing a shitload of damage. When we finally close the curtains on him, we finally get to read what happened to Peter's parents, and as it turns out, they died in a plane crash. When Trask bought the suit, Brock Sr. tried to put the suit on while on a plane, and he caused the plane to crash due to him losing control. This is what caused the death of both Peter and Eddie's parents. We then find out that Venom just disappeared, and S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't able to capture him. After being convicted for his shady symbiote experiments, Trask is seen in a prison where Eddie shows up, and Eddie just straight up eats him. <laughs> Finally, we see Peter and MJ on the roof, discussing where Eddie might be until MJ says that they should just forget about it for a while. Then we see Eddie jumping off a roof in his new suit, and with that, it's over. So overall, the story isn't anything crazy, but I at least found it interesting enough to keep going through with the game, though the set pieces alone would keep me engaged to the end. If you have the chance, please go pick this up, I promise you, it's a decent time, and it's pretty short too, only clocking in at around 4 hours. I'd honestly rather have it be short and sweet rather than the alternative. And with that, I want to thank you guys for stopping by and I hope you all have a great day. I'd also like to thank Nam12399 for helping me with not only the script, but the debate we had earlier. So if you enjoy any of these videos, I highly recommend checking out his channel as it's pretty much the same thing, although he usually shits on games instead of praising them. Yeah, this game fucking sucks.
So, either way, there will be a link in the description to that. I'd also like to say that this will be the first video where I officially announce that I'm going to be setting up a Patreon. Uh, there will be more information on it on the Patreon website, and I will also have a Patreon video coming up sometime within the next month, uh, if it's not out already. So, so if you want to support me, you can head over there where you can find access to behind-the-scenes bloopers, outtakes, weekly updates, and exclusive streams. Speaking of streams, you can also find me streaming on twitch.tv slash thatboyaqua. What the fuck? <laughs> Atlas! Stupid ass! Stupid ass! Fucking... <laughs> oh my god, he's weak to fucking bullets. What a disgrace I am. Absolutely. No, no, no. <laughs> I meant the Matagari thing. With that, that's pretty much it. So I'll see you guys next time. If you like these kinds of videos, make sure you leave a like on the video. Comment about what you think about the black or purple suit or anything else within this video. And if you like these videos, I have more of them. There will be a playlist in the description where I talk about games like Lego Marvel Super Heroes 2, Gravity Rush 2, and I don't know, some other games. I can't really remember off the top of my head. Either way, I love you guys, and I'll see you guys next time.